thank you so much for doing this. Like, um, you know, this is a kind of first and a special for International Women's Day. And you are really awesome and uh, a very inspirational character. Like, um, and to be able to do everything that you're doing is like a dream for someone like me. And I'm pretty sure a dream for lots of uh, young women and men out there. So thanks very much. Oh, I'm so glad that you got in touch. It's been, um, I've been watching your project evolve and I am obsessed with the fact that you're doing karaoke with your cleanup. <laughs> Man, what a good idea. What a good idea. Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking the other day, I was trying to think of, um, because I bought this this golden microphone for the school children at school because I thought it'd be nice for them to do something creative in lessons because sometimes geography topics can be quite dry. So I thought, you know, maybe they could create a rap or, or something, you know, um, that might make it a bit more fun and just memorable so they can, you know, yeah. they can kind of recall it. Um, and then obviously because of lockdown and, you know, for the past couple of months, I've literally just been on my own. <laughs> so... <laughs> maybe it's maybe it's just cabin fever who knows but you start to be quite creative in your mind and come up with lots of things so uh I just thought at first I thought about having some kind of like boom attached to me with the like a GoPro looking back and then just doing karaoke down the streets just to brighten up people's day um but and then I thought you know what why not combine beach cleaning with karaoke and, and see what happens here really <laughs> brilliant brilliant yeah anything we can do to to make it a bit more fun and just kind of you know a lot of people need some positivity right now in the world so so if we can we can give that to people <laughs> definitely but it looks like that you um you're are you quite a busy person you seem like you might be quite a busy person yeah this time of year um is insane so i where i work um as a marine educator slash outreach coordinator I am organizing National State Week or coordinating National State Week, and it's a countrywide initiative to try and engage people with the ocean to then, if you have a connection with the ocean, you're more likely to care about it, right? So um, we have uh, events all across the country, some online, but mostly in-person um, engagements where people actually go get wet. Um, and so it's this month, or sorry, it's starts March, um, March 6th to March 14th. But because I can't play, be in all these places at the same time, it, it, it extends the entire month for me because I can't squeeze everything into a week. I've got to be like everywhere. So it's basically sea month. So it's all March. Um, it's really hectic. Our new website is going to go up on Monday, hopefully. So this weekend's going to be real busy for me. Um, but, you know, it's good stuff. That sounds absolutely amazing that it, it seems like a whole country rallies around and supports something that they care about. And I guess as an island nation, that's quite an important message, really. Yeah. Uh, and I, I mean, there is pockets of the country where it's, you know, there's small groups that are, are really, really involved. And then we have pockets of the country where it's really quite rural, probably really hard to get the message out to people. But hopefully in the next year or so, um, we have more webinars that are going to you know, just be recorded and stuff to have as resources for people that want to know more but don't know where to start or um, or want to get more involved with uh, encouraging the government to protect more, um, which is something that I'm really passionate about, ocean, ocean protection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and that's what my research currently is kind of on marine reserves. So it's um, it's been a wild ride. Yeah. And from working full-time so studying part-time and working mostly full-time <laughs> so. how do you how do you have the energy or how do you keep your energy levels up to be able to do all this thankfully um if you put some field work in the middle and you actually get out and get underwater it just i mean there was some study that i read recently about how you know spending time in nature just like there's actual i mean there's been evidence for years it makes you more creative. It just makes you feel more alive, more in touch, more engaged, more connected. Um, so yeah, just making sure I get out, go for a run and a swim in the morning before I start work when I'm not in Poo Boy. Um, and then yeah, just getting out for a paddle or a play in the free diving and whatever it is that helps <laughs> a lot. 
Yeah, I think a lot of people forget to do that these days, just actually have some time to yourself and just allow your mind to think. I think nowadays when everyone, when anyone has a spare bit of time, it's straight to their phone or straight to social media or, you know, mm. I'll check my emails or check something. There's, you know, no one takes the time to actually just be on their own, be in nature and then just to let your mind wander and, you know, keep your mm. mind in the present, but both take a look at the future and take a look at the past as well, I think is it's quite it's quite nice. And like you said, it's you get lots of creative juices, like especially you mentioned running when I'm running. I'm, my head is like, oh, I could do yeah. this. Oh, I could do that. It's a really nice space. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely love that. And and, and then the, the freshness that you feel when you find when you sit at your desk and you're like hair sweat and you're just like yeah I did that this morning and I've got all these <laughs> ideas and I'm like ready um otherwise yeah it's, and I, I can't imagine places where it's like in New York where the rest of my family is there's so many well in the height of the pandemic people were like afraid to go outside because they were going to see people and because they were going to you know cross paths with somebody else but then just like and it's winter time now I mean it, oh, I know it's, it's definitely harder when it's cold outside to be outside, but man, it's just without a lot, without that connection, mm -hmm. people aren't, aren't really thinking about the bigger picture and then they're lost. They're not thinking about the planet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what's been a little bit shocking um, actually, because I remember when lockdown first started and we had all these amazing kind of stories in the news about how nature would, was reclaiming its place back on this planet. And you saw, you know animals that you hadn't seen for ages crop up in certain mm -hmm. places or um yeah there were just more sightings and it just it's like less pollution all types of things and you thought you know what this might be a really nice change for governments and people and individuals and businesses to to reflect and think actually you know we're losing something that's integral for this planet um but then slowly you just walk down the street and you're like, oh look mask 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 or you know, then you start seeing more pollution and you think, oh, OK, actually, maybe things haven't changed so much. <laughs> but yeah. but you know what? I think I think the environmental sector sometimes I mean, I've been to lots of presentations and they can always seem a little bit defeatist. I'm not sure if you, you've ever sat in a presentation where, you know, they'll focus by talking about 90 percent of that presentation is about the problems and then there'll be a kind of 10 percent about what we can do to help um so and sometimes in the, yeah in that kind of sector we're a bit more defeatist than we actually should be and i think actually it's about reversing that and and talking about what we can do and then a little bit about the problems that exist oh, we were just talking about that yesterday i was part of a um litter intelligence education program workshop um and they actually do um they set up they have methods that are uh repeated across different sites across the whole country and they try and make the sites um revisit the sites uh, every season so four times in a year and collect data in a hundred by ten a hundred meters wide long by ten meters wide area collect all the litter and then actually categorize it's it's a very mindful task where you put everything into the categories and stuff but that that we're at the workshop we were just talking about yeah how we've got to tell the kids that this is something that we can do that can change things because that those, those statistics are going on a national database and actually informing policy and making change. So we've got, we've really got to focus on that. Look, empowering, empowering people instead of the doom and gloom. Yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. Oh, and it seems like, you know, with what you're doing, we're trying to engage the nation, um, you know, across that month of March, well, a month for you, two weeks for normal people. <laughs> Seems like a great way to do it. Um, so we've got here, so Marine Education Outreach Manager, and then we have the University of Auckland part-time and work and research at Long Bay <laughs> as well. So, so the part, the research and stuff, all that fits into where I work. In some it's the same setting, but uh, yeah, completely different stuff. So some days I'll be visiting on a boat and dropping cameras in the water and whatnot. And then other days I'm like on the shore. I used to be teaching kids more and now I'm stuck in the office heaps. But one day that'll change, but one day. <laughs> I mean, I suppose it's, it would be a nice balance when it's to be kind of out in the field, collecting data mm -hmm. and then be in front of children, um, you know, teaching them and inspiring about the work that you're doing and then you've got your mm. office-based bits too 
so that's so that's the kind of part you enjoy the most is it is it being in front of the children yeah yeah and i mean covid kind of changed uh i i don't think that was really the turning point for me it was obviously just getting i've been at the organization for four years so i kind of just took on more and more responsibilities that kept me in the office but in the beginning yeah it started off as taking the kids sailing spending all day taking them on journeys in the marine reserve like go paddleboard up to the north end of the marine reserve go snorkeling um paddle back um teach them you know safe um you know safety in the water or you know how to float on the back and do the survival chain um and then just yeah spending entire days outside with the kids when usually they're in, at their school so for some schools in new zealand they don't you know even though they're not that far from the beach they don't actually include much water stuff some schools do they have a water wise program but man these kids light up when they get in the ocean they're just like you know it, either they don't get the opportunity to go to the beach very much, maybe their parents aren't um, beach lovers. So yeah, when you get like students that are so excited, it just rubs off on you and it makes you just, yeah, happy endlessly for like, yes, it can sometimes be frustrating, sometimes. But, um, <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> Listen to me. Okay, don't run up into the water. Where's your life jacket? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, you've no, had I, I think that's really key, actually. Well. I think what you know, for some people, some of those children, it might actually be the first time they've ever been to the coast. I know that in the UK, um, a charity I used to work for, we used to take inner city children, um, you know, from Birmingham and London and places, and you know, they've landlocked, completely landlocked, and some of them have never even left the city. And you take them to the beach and, you know, they put their feet in the water and they, they take a look into the rock pools and everything. And, you know, their face lights up and you hope that maybe just from that one instant, then they go back to their, their home. Maybe they start doing a bit of research or reading about the underwater world or anything. And it kind of gives them that spark to be able to think, oh, you know what, this might be an area that I want to study in or explore further at some point. I think it's really, I think it's really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so what is your kind of favorite thing or process or creature or your influence that the ocean has on you um, or an effect that it has on you? Um, I think the waves are the most humbling thing for me, especially like I don't go out and big surf often at the moment, <laughs> but when you do get a rough day or something, you just get um, get out the back. Uh, you, you surf, you know, you, you, you finally, you get out back and there's this like, thank God I made it kind of feeling <laughs> sometimes, depending on how big the surf is. You're like, thank God I made it. And wow, like you just have to take it all in. So I think um, surfing has definitely, it was one of those things that actually um, built up my respect for the, for the ocean um, and then boating as well. But yeah, I, favorite thing you know when you said like favorite thing or effect or whatever and it's like yeah that humbling feeling that you get in, in rough conditions and then you can go out the next day and it'll be absolutely still and calm and it's just yeah something about that that change in in the surface of the water and the power that that the ocean holds that's probably my favorite mm. I love how you you said the word kind of respect as well because I think a lot of people sometimes don't have um, a lot of respect for the ocean. I used to work as um, like a, someone that used to stand on the beaches and just give kind of safety information to some people who weren't aware of what riptides were or things like this. And um, you know, sometimes you get people going down with big inflatables with like beer cans in their hand and walking off into the water and you're like, oh my God. With like, an offshore breeze. Yeah. On a day where there's an offshore yeah. breeze, eh? Yeah. yeah. I know. And you're like, wow. Um, yeah, that's nice then. So how, how long have you been surfing for? I mean, I'm really, I mean, I started kite surfing a couple of years because you mentioned like eventually getting out to the back. I think because I surfed so infrequently, it was taking mm. me <laughs> further than more time to get there. So I started putting up a kite and then zipping out. <laughs> I haven't tried kite surfing yet. Um, I started learning how to surf when I was in New York, my uncle used to take me out a couple of times, but I didn't really, I took surf lessons in Australia when I studied abroad there, like six, seven years, seven years ago. 
Man, I don't know. Um, and then, yeah, when I came to New Zealand and um, met my partner, uh, ever since then, I was absolutely hooked. Um, I think because when I first came to New Zealand, I didn't have any of my own gear. Like you start off and I think I brought my fins and my mask with me and that was it. Um, I ended up buying a, a decent wetsuit here because I didn't have any proper neoprene. I had a hand-me-down one, but it was my uncle's and it was like, you know, the shoulders. <laughs> it's meant for a man. And I was wearing this thing and obviously it was not going to keep me warm. When I arrived in New Zealand, it was, um, it was, yeah, not, it was definitely not warm. Um, but yeah, so since I guess the past five years that I've been living in New Zealand, I could finally call myself a surfer because I can. I, I, I actually prefer stand-up paddleboard surfing, not because it's easier, Mm -hmm. But because around where I am, um, there's usually small waves. And right. so rec recently, it's like, you're not going to take a short board out in the small waves. You'll have more fun if you're on a, a, a surf sub. Um, so we've got a selection. We've got a little variety of, of subs that you can take out and play in the waves on. Oh, that's great. I think, actually, it just reminded me of a story. I think um, it was you. I think um, I went to the dive shop one day where we both used to work and I think you were saying that you were out there on your stand up paddleboard in the morning and then there was was it an orca or something or you spotted a whale or dolphin or something I think there was dolphins that morning yeah, yeah. there was dolphins that morning but um it's actually been since I've been working at, at American Long Bay incredibly I, I never thought it, it would I would have this that experience where an orca swims under your paddleboard and you feel that you actually have that oh my god they're huge mm -hmm. like feeling but yeah no that didn't it, I didn't actually get that close to them when I was at Goat Island but then I spent four years at, at Merck and man I've yeah I've paddled with dolphins and orca a couple times now so and and their dorsal fin when you when you're paddling next to like a male orca dorsal fin comes up to like almost like shoulder height it's insane wow their, their dorsal fins are massive they come wow. up and just just you know they're surfacing and when they're next to you it's it's crazy yeah oh that's amazing yeah I still remember when I started Goat uh Goat Island I think it was the, the previous day or the day before but the dive shop was saying that there had been orcas in in the National Marine Reserve itself and they were playing with snorkelers and I did get the chance to play with some dolphins one morning and I remember I forgot my weight belt so you're obviously trying to swim down and play with the the dolphins but you've got your wetsuit out and you keep bobbing to the top and you have to oh, right go back down to try and play with them again but it was so fun I think with, with the New Zealand and you know talking about the water one of the things I noticed straight away it just seems to have a, a specific color like the color of the water in New Zealand is just a color that I haven't really seen anywhere else it's like a really magical color yeah no it's definitely it's different from and, and the fact that you know below the surface you well in most places it's either sand or kelp and when you look at the satellite imagery from above um and you see the, the different the color changes from coastal out to deep yeah that deep blue is is something else and um i'm really excited to hopefully go um did you ever get to the poor nice islands when you were here oh, i didn't get that i because I, I, I left the um marine reserve and then I went to work for Oxfam and then I was based in Auckland yeah. after that so um and then headed out to Indonesia to do a motorcycle trip so but yeah. I mean I'm definitely headed back to New Zealand at some point don't, don't worry okay. about that <laughs> we'll, we'll go out to the four nights um in the four nights it's amazing and when it gets when that summer the summer makes the visibility not so great you've got extra phytoplankton heaps of salts and jellies and stuff and then as it gets cooler, um, hopefully at the end of March to celebrate the end of my extremely hardworking month, I want to go out to the, to the four nights and, and hopefully the blue water will kind of come in then where it's a little bit clearer. Um, and it's, yeah, I don't know exactly how people explain that, the blue water, but it's definitely, there's a difference between your, your coastal inshore nutrient rich and, and a little bit farther when you get off because it's the poor nights are pretty a good distance off the coast and there where it's um, a lot more exposed so you get some some very cool tropical um fish that come in there through the um east australian current yeah 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 that's what yeah. makes it such a different diving location isn't it yeah but then my mate she was just diving down in um, south island and she showed me pictures and it's so green because she's in the fjords 
So obviously what we've seen so far, I haven't dove down there. I haven't dove anywhere uh, outside of the Northland, Auckland kind of area in New Zealand so far. But yeah, it's a different color when you get to the fjords. It's really green. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh. And I'm, yeah, it's obviously you've got a lot of freshwater mixing um, and just different, different processes that would have made it very green. I don't know enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we don't have to stay on that topic for too long. So was it diving? Was that the thing? I mean, how long have you been diving for? This wasn't kind of the, the thing that led you to go into the marine conservation route, was it? Or was it something before that? Um, my, hmm, so my dad used to always take me to the beach with him when he would go fishing. And I, would, I used to like this um, umbrella net like that you could catch bait in. But, you, you know, you're catching them and then you can just throw them back. And mm -hmm. if we wanted to keep a couple, we kept a couple and threw the rest back in. And you caught things that you weren't going to use for bait, like camouflage crabs or any kind of crabs and stuff. And I used to love just, yeah, learning about the stuff by going out with him, pulling the things up and then throwing them back. But it was, it was definitely um, during my university um, on Long Island um, at Adelphi that I studied biology because I thought, oh, it's a versatile kind of degree. And my parents were like, yeah, it's versatile and um, you should go here because um, my dad worked at the, he still works at the uni. And so I could afford to go there because of the amazing thing called tuition remission. So um, it was a, a real blessing. Otherwise, I don't think I would have been able to afford a, a, that kind of level of degree. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and through that, uh, I met one of my favorite professors, um, Aaron Freeman. He had uh, a particular, um, uh, he, he loved marine science, obviously. And so I took all of his classes that I could possibly take. And in my last two years, I got involved in a research project on little mud crabs and um, investigating an invasive parasite that infects mud crabs. And for the for my junior and senior year, um, a couple credits per semester, I put towards um, yeah doing this research and kind of writing up a paper at the end. Um, and then he, uh, I figured out there was a study abroad like exchange program. And they had a, another field course that went to Australia. And so I was kind of like, oh, well, I can't, I'm, I can't do that field course, but I'll do this exchange program and I'll go, I'll go diving in Australia. <laughs> um, and that was what was just like the absolute drove the point home, like experiencing coral reef and uh, diving with a manta ray and a gray nurse shark and all the other incredible marine life there, mm. turtles. It was the first time I dived over the turtle and, and, and in the beginning I did more I did way more snorkeling than I did diving because I couldn't afford diving. <laughs> oh, it's expensive um, in Australia, yeah. Yeah, but I, I did I did save up, <laughs> did put aside money to do my advanced open water while I was over there. Um, I was still, I was pretty new at that point. I was pretty new to diving. So I did my advanced open water and then, yeah, it was kind of just like, okay, I can go a little bit deeper now. Um, and then, yeah, when I went back to New York, I didn't dive until I, and from... I guess over a year in between returning home and then getting back and then getting out to New Zealand. Um, I had a bit of a hiatus because it was like, A, I didn't have any of my own gear and um, B, like New York doesn't have the same, uh, the accessibility, I guess, um, when it comes to diving and stuff. You've got to get, was, a, you've got to get a boat to some yeah. location. Not that many great locations where there's good visibility. Um, and it, it just makes it a lot more complicated when you're not in that diving community and you're just starting off. So because I had done stuff overseas and whatnot, um, my my next diving experiences were um, with the University of Auckland when I came to New Zealand and then with the dive shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully, yeah. Is this your, your dad is a diver as well then, is he? No, he's a fisherman. He likes fishing. He, um, he just has always, he used to sail. He used to sail before I was even born. He did um, sailing races uh, and in, in more tropical places like Bahamas and, and the Keys kind of area. Um, but I never, I never got to go sailing with my dad. Um, we've been on boats together, um, but actually I, I used to get pretty seasick. Um, I still, <laughs> still do um, sometimes. Oh, really? I've built up much. I, I've built up a much better tolerance. I know people here are like, you're gonna live on a boat, but you get seasick. 
I was going to say um, that's a, that's a risky gamble. Um, in, in rough conditions, it actually really depends on the kind of boat and the movement of the boat. So when the boat's moving, like when it's um, just side to side mo motion is what really sets me off. But when you're sailing, there's not so much of that um, unless there's absolutely no wind, um, which <laughs> it can happen. Um, <laughs> but I, I, yeah, uh, unfortunately, yes, I did inherit the motion sickness gene from my mother. <laughs> she was <laughs> terribly motion sick. And unfortunately, yeah, I think that's what's held her back from really experiencing the ocean. But um, yeah, I don't oh, think my dad uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny, actually. My friends, um, because when I was a kid, I used to hate, absolutely was petrified of seaweed. And a lot of the UK beaches, before you get into the clearer waters, you have to go through a section of seaweed. So yeah. usually I would just refuse to go in, go into the ocean. <laughs> and I remember screaming so many times and my dad dragging me and putting, you know, putting me on his shoulder <laughs> and carrying me through it. And he used to drop me in the seaweed and I'd panic and you know, splutter. <laughs> And then, really? um, yeah, and it's funny because all my friends remember this too, and they they always say, I, they say, I just can't believe that you turned out to be a scuba diver and a fanatic with the ocean because you used to be <laughs> so scared of it when you were, you know when you were younger. And I think part of that too was because my dad he he's got I'm not sure he's got this weird thing where he can swim, but if he goes outside of his depth, then he cannot swim. It, I don't know. It, I don't know whether it's psychological, but I've seen him swim. But he, if he cannot touch the floor, then he thinks he cannot swim. But one silly thing he used to do was he used to load us all into a, an inflatable boat, swim off, and then use the inflatable boat for him to be able to swim and then go out deep <laughs> with us. And it's like, Dad, <laughs> if you let go of this, or the wind blows us over, like we're all doomed. So I think there was like this fear factor that was set in from a young age but luckily right. that, that's gone now but with scuba diving I mean that was one of the things that you know being under the water for an amount of time that you're able just to sit there and and just watch these new mm. and exotic and alien creatures and the world I mean that's something I you know I think that everyone should experience at some point in their life yeah no i agree and, and that feeling of weightlessness say on, on this planet you know mm. it's pretty cool i'd really like to hear more about um like how you're engaging people so you said you've got like a new website and then are you physically going into schools are you running some kind of events that people get involved with because this sounds really interesting so um where where i work at merck we got a contract from nzaee which is new zealand association for environmental education and um and so we're coordinating events um some of them are in schools where we're going and we're delivering a presentation and then getting the kids out um uh, especially in low decile areas we got some funding to take to pay for the bus to bring them to the beach mm -hmm. and um have you ever seen a, a waka ama or a, a waka tangata which is like those quite long boats that are paddled. Um, oh, right, a, okay. A, a traditional Maori like war canoe. Um, and they, the kids will have a, a short experience either in the boat and then on, on the land, we'll do some um, exploring on the foreshore when the tide goes out. Um, so there's, it's like, Sea Week has got so many, like it encompasses so many different activities it's just to really engage people with the ocean or their outside environment. Um, if it's an estuary and they just go biking around the estuary, that's, that's a Sea Week event. It could be crafts. There was somebody who made puppets of little freshwater fish and eels and did a migratory fish like presentation with all these kids and their puppets. Um, there's all sorts of art stuff. Um, but I'm today I'm populating the new website for Sea Week, um, which is really exciting because it's a new platform that'll be more um, user friendly and people can see all we've got to offer. Currently, it's pretty outdated, um, but I'm excited because um, it's it starts like events start from from Monday for me, um, and the new website will just be like um, just more visual for people to actually see like it, it's got it features more photos and stuff like that mm -hmm. um 
but en enough about that. Mark does some really important stuff where we have um, opportunities for schools that uh, don't have extra funds to go on camp to do a, a Blake experience over winter time. So Blake, you know, Sir Peter Blake was a really um, a remarkable sailor, but also an environmentalist um, who spread the word about these places that were under um, under threat from either deforestation in the Amazon or just um, it, places that we didn't know so much about when we sailed to Antarctica. Um, so the namesake came from asking his family if um, we could use his name in the Marine Education and Recreation Center because his values aligned so much with ours. And he had visited before, he actually chose to be a part of the organization, um, but, but wasn't able to before, um, wasn't able to do much there before he passed. Um, so this, this winter time, this winter, <laughs> this winter, we're gonna have um, more opportunities for low death style schools in, in Auckland to come to Merck, to have a, a leadership camp and an experience that they might not other, otherwise been able to afford. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a real prominent place um, in, in Auckland, you know, just outside of the city. Um, so you, you can't see the, the sky tower or the bridge from the beach. But once you get out into the Marine Reserve, you can see how you're close to the city, but still close to uh, the outer islands and the outer Gulf. You can see those islands in the distance. And it's like, a, um, I guess it's that urban environment that's still well, well preserved in some, in some sense. Um, doing my Marine research there for the past yeah, year and a half, has really given me some real stark contrast when I look at underwater videos, faded, faded cameras, to look at fish populations inside and outside. It's mm -hmm. really startling that this, there's not any snapper outside the reserve that we're, that we're being able to capture on the camera. Um, whether they're more afraid of the actual setup and they're more wary so they don't come into view, or whether this, there really wasn't any fish that were showing up, you know, like very like some small ones and the occasional thing, but but like there's a pot of a, a little jar with holes in it and a bait sitting on the attached to this frame, and usually you know fish should be attracted to that, right? Yeah, yeah free fish. Yeah. I have thirty replicates, so there's thirty videos that are about forty five minutes long that I've watched, and and really there's just some. There's hardly any fish outside the reserve. Um, so that was just, it was really like, I didn't know if I was gonna be able to show that. So I have sites inside and outside the reserve on the north end and the south end. Um, and I didn't know what to expect. So I thought I was gonna be seeing heaps of fish. And then meanwhile, inside the reserve, the maximum amount of snapper that I've caught in one frame is six. In at Goat Island, uh, you could have upwards of 50, you know, 20 something or, or something is like the average. So a well-established marine reserve that's um, a little bit farther from the city and farther from the sedimentation and pollution that's also impacting the environment. Um, I've definitely gone off topic. I don't even know what the original question was. But <laughs> well, no, actually, it's kind of on topic in the sense that um, because, I mean, you're using using lots of like video and, and imaging, which can be so powerful in in... In, in sometimes marketing like the work that uh, and the protection that's needed because I, I think that a lot of the time when it comes to marketing the underwater world it's like super super hard I mean if you've got mm. cuddly pandas and you've got bears and you've got you know creatures with spots and stripes that are you know quite accessible um on land they, they're kind of they're easier to market to to, to lots of people across yeah. the world but I feel that sometimes actually the underwater world and, and the devastation that's happening is quite difficult to market. But, you know, with your videos of the traps and I mean, free food under the water in quite, you know, the underwater world is not it's not a nice place for a lot of fish. It's very competitive, <laughs> you know, and they're, they're always trying to just just to, to get by just to live. So the fact that there's nothing there coming up to get that free food, it, it says, you know, quite a powerful message. Yeah, uh, so actually, um, that that data and stuff is, is all part of my thesis, and I did my 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 thesis presentation not that long ago in, in January, end of January, and I hadn't touched it for a little while until um, I realized there was a gap in Sea Week events in in this area. So where I am in Puvoy is not too far from the Hibiscus Coast, and um, 
I got in touch with someone who had who was interested in hearing about my research um, and said, look, if you wanted to put on a week event, um, let's make something happen and I'll get some other people involved. And so that's coming up next week. Um, I'll be giving my presentation that I, I gave to my fellow students um, and hopefully just opening the, the floor for more discussion around marine protection in the Gulf, especially because like Long Bay Oka is, is just south of Whangapara. So it's um, quite close geographically. So it'll be easy for people to relate to because they live on that coast. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it, it's that imagery that I think is going to be the most helpful in actually inspiring people to, to think about the issue in a sense that we can do something about it. If we stop fishing so much, if we don't take, don't take your limit, don't take, you know, more than you need. Um, and it's, unfortunately, it's taking a long time for regulations to change and for protection to go into place. So I think it's really about the people being aware and, and making the decisions for themselves um, while we wait for the government to actually put those things into action. Mm -hmm. Wow, that sounds really that sounds really good that must be really exciting are you, are you really excited yeah i'm pretty excited i was working on the presentation last night and i'll probably look at it again later i need to practice again um but i i didn't i don't give that many other than delivering to kids i don't give that many public talks um i did one last year and i did a workshop um with, to teach people how to make beeswax wraps um mm -hmm. and that was a couple months ago um, and then since then, yeah, there's been a gap that I, I did, I did want to do more of that because I feel like there, that my new niche <laughs> is going to be communicating the science in a, in a, in a public, in a public um, setting, but I've got to be true to the science and make sure there's plenty of data to represent it, not over dramatize it, but also, you know, make people aware that there's all these awesome papers that are written by very, very intelligent people. But nobody reads scientific papers. They need somebody to communicate that stuff for them. Yeah. So I think that's where my I speak for the sea thing is going to come, but probably not going to really delve into that until I finish my degree in July. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I think that's really important. I think it's so important trying to relate the messages in science. Like you say, sometimes they can be quite dense and people take a mm. look at something that's got, you know, over 100 citations and think, oh, you know, I need this in a more manageable and bite-sized, uh, <laughs> like, you know, morsel for, for you to chew on. So that, that leads us quite nicely for actually into you talking about I speak for the sea. Like, so how, that's, how long have you been working on this now? It's been, has it been a couple of years or something? Or years? Over, over, no, just over a year. So, um, uh, maybe more than that. Maybe I've completely forgotten about. So the beginning part of it, I I didn't when I didn't have a website. It was just an idea, and I had a a WordPress site, but it wasn't like you know a, a domain name that you paid for. <laughs> um, so it's just it's it's only hmm, maybe it is two years. Wow. Um, it all started because of um, Plastic Free July in, two years ago and making a pact to myself that I was going to try and reduce my waste for an entire year. Um, like not, not really realizing <laughs> at the moment. Um, well, thankfully in New Zealand, COVID hasn't impacted us the same way as the rest of the world. I've still been able to go to those bulk stores and actually fill up my jars and stuff like that. And if that wasn't possible, um, I really don't, you know, I don't think that the way that I'm living now with my entire cupboard full of jars was going to actually be, you know, feasible. It's, it's, um, it's almost unattainable for, for most of the world. Um, so the whole thing really started with coming back from Hawaii, May 2015. Uh, no, not 2015. Uh, 2018, sorry. Coming back from Hawaii, May 2018, um, and on the beach, uh, there was there was a, a few penguins. Actually, we've had we had a, a weird thing where it has to do that has to do more with climate change than with um, than with plastic. Um, the penguins probably had a um, a difficult season. There was a lot of storms. They might not have been able to find enough food. Um, I was I got to help necropsy some of the penguins, and the penguins were found to be emaciated, so really starving. 
um, like all 14 of them that were part of that sample size. Um, and essentially, there's a few things that really just made me feel like, oh my God, I need to do more. I'm not doing enough. I need to tell people about stuff and use my voice to actually try and make, create some awareness because I just felt like I wasn't doing enough. Um, and another little piece of the whole Hawaii thing was I, I, had, I had the amazing experience. I'd never swam with dolphins before until then. Um, like, I think I would have experienced them coming by on a dive once or twice, but I was actually, you know, like they came over to check us out. Like I got the footage of the dolphin swimming right at me. And, oh, um, and, and that, was really, that was really powerful. And then swimming with turtles was really powerful. But the same, the same week as all of these incredible marine experiences, I was still off in the water snorkeling at uh, Hanu, Hanauma Bay, and it's just just outside of Honolulu, and it's like this incredible gold, like horseshoe shaped, golden sand, beautiful coral reef, and everything. I was still in the water, and um, <laughs> the whole point of this Hawaii trip was to meet up with my family. So it was me and Ben meeting up with my family in Hawaii. That was a halfway point, and that was a, that was the first and the only time I've been there, and. Um, this was one of my last days on Oahu, on Oahu and Ben went back to the beach and I was still snorkeling just because it was difficult for anybody to get me out of the water at that point. And he, when I came back it, in the area between his two legs on the sand in like, it's like not even a meter squared. He had a whole handful of microplastics, like fragments. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a photo of it and I looked at it and I kept thinking about it. I couldn't forget about it. I was just like, I had photographed heaps of rubbish in the water while I was there as well. And I knew, uh, while that's not as commonplace to find on our beaches in New Zealand, yes, there is a plastics problem, um, but it, it's just not the same as it was on that beach in Hawaii. Um, but I just, there was just some, something powerful about those fragments and thinking about the magnitude of the issue um, and just being like, I don't want to contribute to that anymore. So I tried to eliminate all the plastic that I used to consume, um, but there's still things that, you know, I haven't been able to completely give up cheese. <laughs> it's one of the things <laughs> you can't find without plastic. Um, and, and yeah, so it's, that's where I kind of started to be like, I need to record this and start a blog. And then after that is where I'm like, well, it's not all about just plastic free living because that's only one tiny step or individual action that you can actually do. Um, and that's uh, from, from about a year ago is when I was like, I need to branch out. And although I haven't been very active on my blog recently, just too busy, um, I am going to probably try and switch a little bit and, and just go into more science communication because, yeah, our individual actions matter, but um, it's, it's, we need to do so much more than just stop using plastic. Um, mm -hmm. So <laughs> the time and maybe, maybe maturing the past couple of years has made me realize that um, it, it is a <clears throat> it is a privilege to be able to do the plastic free thing. It takes me a lot of extra time, and um, for someone who's right now going into one of the busiest times, <laughs> it's you're going to slip up. Like I'm going to have to, you know. Thankfully, the bakery that I go to, you know, I can get bread in my own bag, and so I can avoid plastic bread bags and stuff like that. But there's still times where you're just like, it's it's going to happen. You just slip up, and you're like, I need this, you know, something quick. Um, and, and yeah, I just realized that 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 plastic free message is um, as, as uh, romantic as the idea is, we need to push the government and we need to create, yeah, you know, we need to change policies. It's, it's more, it's more than just what I can do. So um, yeah, there's a lot of awesome organizations that I've been talking to in New Zealand that are doing a really great job of trying to encourage people to have their say when it comes to um, submissions to the government and um, just petitions and stuff like that. So that's something I want to try and promote through my page. Great. I mean, how does it work with um, the government in New Zealand? So I know, for example, in the UK, if we can gather up 10,000 signatories, then they will give us a response to, to that petition. Wow. If we gather up 100,000 signatories, then they will have to debate it in, in in parliament so i don't know that, that's, that's i don't know law in the in the uk yeah so that's which, which is quite nice because actually anyone can go on the government's website and create a petition for anything and if you can get enough yeah. um and rally enough people behind it then 
you know, well, 10,000 or 100,000, <laughs> then something, you know, something can be done just actually from an individual's perspective, which is quite nice. Because I, I feel like, like what you were talking about, you know, with um, trying to kind of avoid plastic, you know, you cannot be perfect in this, you know, you just have to mm -hmm. be imperfect and you have to take baby steps. And I think that's more of the message more than anything. And of course, you know, it seems like a lot of the onus is down like to the individual to be making, to be making all these changes. And you think, hang on, <laughs> like I'm one person, yeah. there's a business an organization and a multinational company that <laughs> um, they're, they're giving me the option of being able to purchase this plastic. So, whereas I feel like a lot of pressure sometimes gets put on the individual. So it's about flipping that to actually make yeah. the individual more powerful um, and, and then like, you know, push back at, at the people that yeah. kind of offer us these products and things. <laughs> but yeah. it's, it, no. it's great. I think, I think you're, you're onto a winner with the communicating the science. I think, I think that's super, super important. And, you know, you've got such a speciality in, in the field that you work in too. Um, you know, I'd like to see some more mud crab blogs coming my way from you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks <laughs> that'd be great and I mean because obviously it seems like you really enjoy that kind of kind of commu communication side of things then I mean you obviously enjoy being in front of children and I would say you're very good at communicating so next week when okay. you're doing your presentation I think you're going to smash it thanks no I, I think I should have um studied science communication instead of <laughs> um I, I just don't know I struggle with scientific writing um, and I've got a lot of um, I've got a lot of obstacles coming up when I need to do more statistics and actually be able to uh, create histograms and stuff like that. Um, so that's something that scientific writing, like writing my thesis and my paper is, is going to be more challenging for me than actually writing in layman's terms. <laughs> but I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure that this whole experience doing my master's for a thesis instead of taking individual classes and writing papers, um, I, I, I chose that because I already had a project that I was really keen on. Um, and I thought it's gonna be more flexible and more realistic for me than being able to attend classes, especially you know classes that would give you a wide breadth of knowledge, but might not help you hone in into what you're already really interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad how this has kind of turned out, but yeah, I want to, I want to actually take um, some, eventually when I have time, take another online writing course um, and just hone in on my, on my communication skills. <laughs> oh, that's great. So is this what you did for, I speak for the sea? Did you take a kind of online writing course to, to try and uh, get your blogging skills down? Not yet. No, it's going to be, it's, it's, it's going to get better from now. <laughs> Oh, no, no, I'm not saying it's bad or anything like that. <laughs> but it's, it's quite interesting what you say um, about the type of skills that you need to have to work in this area, because I think maybe from an outside perspective, like people that are thinking about going into science, maybe worry about that. They think, oh, am I the type of person that can um, analyze things inside a laboratory or, oh, actually, no, maybe, I mean, I feel like I'm quite group with my hands so does that mean are there jobs available to go out and just do data collection or I think sometimes youngsters and people have a, a view of scientists of just being you know people that live inside a little cupboard and don't see yep. you know sunshine and they're just right constantly writing papers. I, I reckon I almost fit into that category because when I first came to New Zealand and I was like, I, I, I want to pursue my, my a further degree. I was, I was saying my master's back then and people were like, are you sure you don't want to do a PhD? I was like, no, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not cut out for it. Um, but I, yeah, no, I, I think that it's, um, if you set if you're that passionate about something and you set your heart, you know, your heart set on it and you set your mind to it, um, you, you can do it, but it, it's, it's not easy. And I know that that will be um, something that most, most youth are either worried about not being good enough. I mean, everybody worries about that, being self-conscious about, okay, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not meant to be here. I'm whatever. Um, that's definitely something everyone that's human is going to battle with. Um, and it's something that I've had trouble with as well. I didn't know if I was going to be ready for 
my postgrad. I didn't know if I was smart enough, especially because I hate math. <laughs> um, <laughs> <He> doesn't. <laughs> I was shit at math. Um, and I, I was good at science. I was good at earth science. But I was so shit at math in school. Um, so yeah, thankfully Excel does all the math for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, Excel. We like Excel. But, but but it's still like learning all the intricacies of Excel. That that you know this. this thing, thank goodness there's been someone um, who's kind of I've looked up to as a mentor um, throughout throughout this. Um, and, and that's kind of you know you don't have the same uh, relationship with your advisor as you did with like a teacher when you were young, like one that would almost help you step by step. Um, when you get to this level, it's, it's a lot of hands off and it's more, um, it's definitely self-driven. So mm -hmm. it's got, it's got its um, uh, attractiveness for the flexibility that I have at the moment but it, you have to be really um, dedicated and focused on it in order to get it done. What, what, um, how do you do that? I mean, what, what kind of, do you have any things in place that get you focused in the morning? I remember when, mm -hmm. um, a few years ago, actually, when I used to work from home, I used to, one of the things that would make me really motivated in the mornings was I used to put on heavy metal music and I just have a blast of heavy metal music and it just used to kind of, get me really amped and I'd be like right now let's now <laughs> and that kind of really set me up for the day and I used to have these heavy metal breaks and they used to keep me really focused <laughs> wow no it's definitely not my style um <laughs> I, I have kind of fallen and I, I do like a little bit of you know house music or something occasionally to get you like while you're watching fish videos you're like jamming along <laughs> that's that's cool yeah so through all your I mean studying and being out in the field and data collection and all types of things have you got any memorable kind of experiences you want to share hmm um yeah there's 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 so many though um, I'm trying to hone in on one that like I guess recently I was real buzzy we were working underwater doing lots of <laughs> lots of stuff physical stuff but I'm on my way back to the boat <laughs> um I was just like, what is that? Oh my gosh. It was like a squadron of squid in a line. They were all in a line, like traveling. And they were just like, um, have you ever, uh, I don't know what the equivalent is in the UK, but growing up in the US, the blue angels, do you know, like the flight pattern of the blue angels? It's like a V. And like yeah, yeah, yeah. all the we planes the are just perfectly, yeah. And they're perfectly spaced apart. These squid were doing the same thing. I was wow. just, I was so in awe. Um, it was really, really cool, and I, I don't know, I don't usually get to get up close to squid, because every other time that I've seen them, they're really quick, and they're just, like, gone, yeah. like, they just shoot off, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and, and so that was, like, one of my, I just recently, I guess, like, over just a month ago or so, it was the first time that I actually got good video, like, GoPro footage of squid, that was exciting, but I'm trying to think, like, I mean, I already, I already mentioned, you know, scuba diving with a with a manta ray and that was the only one time that I've ever seen a manta ray and haven't seen one since um but man that was just such a uh, there's a photo that the um the, the dive master instructor flash also photographer took um with me with my like arms like straight out right next to it like I was just looking over at it and like because its wingspan is like well over three meters Mm. Um, and I'm just like looking at it and so there's this photo of like me with my little airplane arms <laughs> um, just looking at this manta ray next to me um, and that was probably that's definitely one of the the most memorable experiences um, oh they're amazing yeah. creatures aren't they I just love it when they they're under the water and they kind of tilt and they they stare they stare straight into your soul with their their eyes just really focused on you they're really inquisitive and just really curious and yeah they, they play about in the water too um oh I miss kind of snorkeling with manta rays guys, every day yeah you saw these in Indonesia uh now I used to work in Australia I used to be a dive master there and I used to be a manta oh, ray nice. yeah on the west on the coast, coast. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we didn't, didn't see them in Indonesia. Oh. Uh, Indonesia, okay. if you go to Nusa Penida, uh, Nusa Penida off of Bali, so next to kind of Lombok, and then they've got 
uh, I think in Raja Ampat. I mean, I saw some manta rays actually when I was diving at um, Komodo National Park in Indonesia. There um, some, it's quite nice. But yeah. I mean, the currents are so strong there, they're kind of just zoof, zipping about. You, oh, you don't really stay with right. them too long. They're just flying about everywhere. Whereas in Australia, because there was a coastal manta ray population, they're up there all the time and they're yeah. in there making chains and feeding. So yeah, and doing like, loops. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so cool. Just amazing. I, I need to go to Western. Western Australia is on my list. I, I remember talking about it now. It's one of like few. Uh, it's funny because with my geography students, I'm trying to um, come up with case studies of places that I've been to so I can give them more of a, a story behind some of the topics we cover. And then I, one of them was Western Australia. And we were doing um, just kind of uh, taking a look at climate change as how it's affected like the, the coral there. And it's actually one of the few places in the world where it just hasn't had as many bleaching events as, you know, for example, the Great Barrier Reef mm -hmm. and other places in the world. It's got a really healthy coral population there. And the management strategies that they put in place there are just great. So actually it turned out to be a really yeah. crappy case study because nothing bad was happening there. <laughs> so, um, that could be, you know, okay, because the biodiversity is being preserved and it's well managed, it's probably why it's, it's, it's not um, showing, you know, the, the stress because it's only one stressor and not multiple, multiple, multiple stressors like on the opposite side of Australia, but it could be part of the reason why it's doing well. Yeah. Um, that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty hot there. I mean, they've got some really good kind of activist groups. So whenever there's some off offshore drilling that decide that they want yeah. to do something, you know, quite close, they're like, no way, you're not. Yeah. You're I've not. Signed doing, a few. Which is quite Yeah, I, I, I see that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, that, that's really nice. Um, yeah, no, it was a, it was a yeah, beautiful place to live. I really miss, I really didn't want my visa to ever end there, but it was a working holiday visa. So unfortunately I had to go. I was kind of, you know, dragging and kicking and, oh, please. <laughs> and actually, I mean, a lot of the people I met there, I mean, I still have them on social media and they're just still living these really chilled existence. You know, I mean, it's such a small town, Coral Bay, and, you know, they're on the water most days and, and because they're quite close to the continental shelf, they'll just get random things sent up like mola mola fish and just all sorts of other things like come up from the depths for a couple of days, We're like hello, and then off they go back. And it's like, what is going on here? Oh, cool. Yeah, so cool. <laughs> um, mm. All right, so, okay. So talking about maybe like, uh, you know, younger people trying to, try to think about getting into marine science or conservation or you know even just working or volunteering for community projects and stuff and I mean obviously you've um, gone the, the academic route and there's lots of I guess different routes routes to do this but I mean do you mm -hmm. have any initial advice to, to give to, to people? Yeah like, like you brought up you know internships um, I think how I got um, a good experience um, during my undergrad was was through internships. There was like a fellowship program, um, and my junior year and my senior year, no, yeah, over the summer break, um, I, I had internships. Um, diff way different experiences, not even marine science related, but it was those experiences that helped shape the journey and the path um, that I am on. Um, and so. <laughs> I think you would know this story that the reason I came to New Zealand was to get more experience in the marine science kind of field. And I picked out, like, you know, I was like, I'm going to go to Lee Marine Laboratory. <laughs> and someone who I was working with over there on, uh, in New York on those crabs and those parasites, um, she did her PhD um, at Lee Marine Lab. And so it was her that kind of a just made me aware of it but b also was like here's a contact you can get in touch with them they have a studentship program so you should apply for their studentship i don't know when it closes and i don't know if you're eligible but you should try and it was that <laughs> that i applied for bought the plane ticket before i knew if i was even going to be like considered a studentship a oh. fellowship or whatever um and it wasn't until maybe a month after i arrived in new zealand and i was already volunteering at the lab um, that I, I was 
awarded the, the studentship. Um, so that was a couple more months of, of um, yeah, they paid you for some of your work. Um, it was a really great um, way for me to bridge that gap between, to, to get back into, okay, am I, am I going to do a postgrad? Um, so yeah, internships have definitely um, have helped me heaps because you, you get to also experience Usually, it's it's more than one project. Um, you have you're a little bit less uh, mm, streamlined into getting pointed at one project. You kind of get to experience a little bit of this and a little bit of this. And as an intern, you're helping this person and this person. Um, so I I mean I know that there's there's still that summer research um, studentship program at at um, at Lee, um, and there'll be so many others at other universities. So. People need to look for those opportunities before they, if they're unsure of if they want to jump, jump into a postgrad. Mm. But um, I, I know that you've done, you've volunteered with so many cool projects. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I haven't, I haven't done heaps of that, but man, if I had, if I had the time to, if I wasn't in those internship programs, um, I would have, yeah, I would have been volunteering um, for, for groups to, to get that experience, to help, to help shape where I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that like what you've kind of touched upon and what I would definitely say is networking is, you know, such mm. an important thing, I think. And actually, sometimes you can you can look at these these type of areas like marine conservation and think, oh, there's there's lots of people applying for jobs in there, lots of people studying it in universities. But actually, what you find out is that these these sectors are, are not as big as you think they are. And one person will know another person who will know another person who will somehow know one of your professors from university or, you know, or someone at the dive shop that you worked at or maybe a dive school that you've been diving with or something. There's always these exactly. connections. And I think once you can, you can tap into that, then you can, you can kind of make strides. Mm. Yeah, no, that's really true. It is very connected, especially, I mean, in New Zealand, I think it's quite funny how, you know i'll just be like oh i know that person or you're doing something and through sea week as well you're like oh this uh, he's given a lecture there or you, it, it really i guess because it is a small country you do get to know um people in the fields across the country um where i mean that didn't quite happen for me in the us that was it's such a huge a much bigger network um but wherever you are connections are so key to finding finding your way yeah, Sea Week must be amazing for that. Actually, I mean, do you do you know who your audience are for Sea Week are? Do you find that they're, they're every Tom, Dick, and Harry, or is it people that are really, really kind of passionate about the sea, or is it a, a, a mixture? Um, it's definitely a mixture. We you have um, <laughs> we have a large newsletter slash you know mail outlet. <laughs> I, th I thought you meant a physically large newsletter, like it was a bedsheet large, like, here we go, nah. everyone. <laughs> I try and keep it short because otherwise I know nobody's going to read it. <laughs> we have, we have um, a lot of contacts and I think about it sometimes. I'm like, so how diverse is our contact list? Like, I don't know. They're just email addresses to me. Like, I haven't collected all of those myself. Um, so I, I do wonder about that, but I do know that we have a lot of teachers that are in primary and, and secondary schools. Um, our, our, one of our targets really, I guess, for the CWE audience is to make sure that it's being um, talked about in schools. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of resources that are developed specifically for CWE. Um, um, there's, you know, different organizations and stuff put together um, either online learning stuff or, yeah, an online, a whole online learning platform these days, I guess everything is, is more accessible if it's online um, and it can reach the whole country. Um, but yeah, so there is a lot of, there's a lot of diversity in our, in our group, in our um, audience. So I just, I just don't actually know if we can, if we are reaching all of the, you know, all of the population. No, I know we're not reaching all of them, but I, I, I do hope that this year, I think there's going to be a couple couple things mentioned on the radio on Facebook app New Zealand just that we are hopefully extending our reach every year um this is only my second year doing it um as coordinator so yeah I hope that we just keep building that momentum um and getting the news out in the mainstream media instead of just our channels we'll reach yeah. more yeah 
I think I think I think the fact that you know you're in your second year proves that it's working. I remember I remember my friend, she started a, a turtle project in the, one of the Cape Verde Islands. And after a year, um, because lots of people were poaching the turtles, but after a year, she had reduced turtle poaching by a just crazy amount. And the way she did it was simply just to hold an annual um, like love the turtles celebration on the island. And, cool. and and that was it. She created a little kind of like two or three day festival where obviously lots of educational activities would be going on and you know people would be dressing up and there was a flotilla and all these different things. <laughs> and it was just this one these couple of days that people really started to enjoy where the messages could be got kind of taken in and then they thought yeah. oh actually you know we're going to protect our turtles instead of kind of they eating. feel ownership yeah mm. they feel a little bit of ownership for protecting them or yeah that's so cool yeah and i think i guess yeah it's the same thing will happen in new zealand it's like especially in the pockets of these localized places next to the coastlines they'll start going you know what this is our coastline to protect. Mm. Yeah, there, you're seeing something. We're seeing something like that happen on Waiheke. Did you get to go to Waiheke? Uh, no, that no, no. I know which island it is. No, yeah. <laughs> I was it so was bad. <laughs> no, it's okay. Hey, I haven't. I haven't even seen South Island yet. People are like, you've been in New Zealand five years and you haven't been to South Island. No, sorry, <laughs> I've been underwater a lot though. Um, <laughs> I've seen more of the hierarchy goals than, than most people. Um, but yeah, no, the, uh, the Waihikians, I think they call themselves, all the people of Waihiki um, have really, you could see how an island community really bands together and they put a Wahui in place for a one kilometer distance from the shoreline um, to protect four key species that, um, you know, they, they have uh, put a special interest kind of thing on. Um, but yeah, I, I really hope that we can extend or expand that. And that's just the stepping stone because one kilometer from the shore isn't going to, to help a whole lot at this point. Um, we need to do something much, much more drastic. But it's look, it's it's a community coming together and saying that's what we want and getting everyone on board. So it's an incredible starting point. Incredible. Yeah. I think the yeah, grassroots initiatives, I think the power of people actually. Because I think sometimes in life you think I'm just one person. What actually can I do? But if you're one person that thinks exactly the same way as you know 50 or 100 other people in your community, and then you get together, then there's a lot that you're able to do. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. Um, yeah, I saw that in Vietnam on that trip. That's you know mm -hmm. after doing that trip, um, it was just amazing how people came together. And you know, in Vietnam before we did that kind of motorcycle trip um picking up all that plastic there was a couple of organizations that used to uh no i mean there was one one in saigon and one in um, hanoi in the north and then you know within like a year after that trip so many organizations started like sprouting up and there was like a green wave across the country and then you had places cities like da nang saying that they're going to be like a single-use plastic free city by like 2035 and stuff and it was like what the hell like you know they took it and Ooh. ran it, like ran them yeah. fastest <laughs> oh, you stoked the fire mate you stoked the fire right up and yeah that's awesome yeah it's so cool to see that that trickle effect mm. trickle wave that's a wave not a trickle <laughs> yeah exactly and so with the like uh, obviously the marine protected areas are they funded by government in new zealand or do you have are they you've uh, You've got a lot of different levels of marine protection, like type one, type two marine reserves. You have marine sanctuaries. You have a Rahui, which is more of a Maori traditional approach that's not um, that's not um, able to be policed by, like you can't take legal action against um, people who break the rules. Um, but if it's a if it's a marine reserve that is um, it is uh, monitored or what word I'm looking for. Um, it is monitored by Department of Conservation, which is a government organization, um, and you, you can take um, legal action against people who are caught poaching in the reserve because that, mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's been in the news quite a lot this summer. Um, people fishing and setting nets in marine reserves, um, right. so, uh, and and some of it, you know, you wonder, okay, is it is it ignorance? But um, do they not know? But it really kind of looks like a lot of them already know that it's marine reserve. It's possible that there's still a lot of 
Um, a lot of people that aren't aware that it's marine reserve, but the people that are fishing there kind of looks like they're quite aware that that's where they get the fish. So um, it's pretty it's pretty worrying um, when you see just people like defy rules like that because it's on your charts, it's on it's signposted. If you're a local, you better know. Like it's kind of obvious. I mean, people think like Go Island was quite well sign written. Um, and it is promoted as a marine reserve and people visit it because it's a marine reserve. But you have so many other little ones like Long Bay, like uh, Mochu Manua, like uh, there's one on Waiheke as well. These littler ones, um, there's probably not as much um, publicity around the fact that it's marine reserve. It might just be another beach. People look at it as another beach. Not Nobody comes, not nobody, but <laughs> hardly ever any anyone would come to Long Bay to go snorkeling to see the fish because one, there's not that great visibility, and two, it, that's not its attraction. Its attraction is its, is its beach and its park, not necessarily seeing the marine life. There is great rock pools, and I, I think that um, someone has kind of highlighted to me the fact that um, there's a lot of new immigrants in the area, and the signs are in their language, so maybe we need to have better, um, a, a much better communication board um, way for people to actually know about it, the history of the marine reserve and and why why it's protected or what that actually means because you know every country you go to marine protected area means something different so a marine preserve or nature preserve in the u.s versus a marine reserve here uh, they mean two different completely different things sometimes um or they just have so many different levels of protection you know it could be that there's no commercial fishing allowed but there is recreational fishing allowed or you know Marine reserve here means absolutely no take, but um, I know that there's marine sanctuaries um, that you just can't go commercially fishing in, but you can still go fishing in. So there's so many um, things that need to be either teased out and made very clear to people. Um, and maybe we could just simplify it, but making more places no take. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that, absolutely that's, no. <laughs> but that's again, that's a communication issue, isn't it, again? You know, it, it only takes kind of signage, you know, which the funding for that can't be too much. Uh, at least do as much as you possibly can to make it clear for people what the rules are. So if they break the rules, there's no excuses. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's like, I know that there's certain, there's a lot of places that you can enter from that marine reserve. So each of them is covered with like, you know, one sign at the moment, but um, maybe it's, it's just not enough for people to stop and read. Like if it's, you know, if it's a sign that's not eye-catching, yeah. it's not going to get red. It doesn't matter. You can have signs everywhere. They're not going to get red. You know, yeah. like. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. yeah. So do you think that, so the future for kind of marine protection in New Zealand, at least, then it's within marine reserves and being, them being policed effectively? Yeah, it's, it's hard. I, uh, because I started learning about marine reserves at Goat Island Marine Reserve, which is a no-take reserve. Um, for for the longest time, like I've just been like that's the answer. But um, it doesn't give the local iwi any any um, privileges, and that is a very political. Uh, it's a big issue um, because um, there is ways that you know the traditional methods of protection are, are are really interesting, and I think it's it's great. It could work, but because it, it's not legally binding it's not going to work because you, you can't enforce it. Um, so I think that someone has been saying that the Marine Reserve deck needs some editing. It might need a little bit of revising to make it more current because it was written in 1992, 1991. Um, and yeah, so it is, you know, getting on in age, but, <laughs> but it, 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 it's principle is so simple. We remove the, um, the effect of human extraction and we see the return of life. You, you see kinnebarons turn into the kelp forest and you see the predators return and they're able to control the, the, the you know, they, can, they make it balanced. So um, I think, I, I love that, um, well, New Zealand's been signed up, um, been a part of that 30 by 30 um, petition. What, I'm sorry, I don't even know exactly what to call it. It's more of like a global idea. Eh? Mm. You've heard of 30 by 30. And I mean, it's 
being uh, it's being promoted by individual organizations, and finally the U.S. has signed onto it as well. But I think that's so crucial. Like our planet is <laughs> so much ocean, but we don't even have thirty percent that's protected. We don't we don't even have like five percent that's protected. It's pretty. There's a there's a Marie, there's a protectedplaces.net or something. I should look it up and give you a link to it. Um, but it's a really cool site that actually shows you the, the, the protection in places all over the world, and it can give you little percentages and stuff. Um, I don't remember exactly who runs it or what where, where all the data comes from, but it was pretty neat. Um, I had a look at it not that long ago, and I was just absolutely you know appalled. And when you look, you can compare the land area that's protected to the sea, and yeah. it's just yeah. like we we have completely neglected the ocean for so long. Let's change that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, you've got people like Sylvia Earle. I mean, I'm not sure that I haven't seen the map recently. Love her. Do you have it? Oh, she's, she's... <laughs> her hope spots. Oh, I love exactly. her. I was going to ask, are there any hope spots in New Zealand? Yeah, I think there is on the South Island. There's one. Um, and it has something to do with the area that the Maui Dolphins, I think, um, oh. are, are in. I, I might look into that a little bit more because I, I am I get the newsletter from Sylvia Earle's team, uh, the Hope the Hope Spots team, um, and yeah, I'm just I love her work. I actually just read um, just read a book. Um, sea Change um, is the name of the book, and it was written by her back in 1993. Um, and I was like, oh, this book is just as old as me. And I'm reading through it, and I'm like, they knew all of the issues back then. We've known about this problem for so long. Yeah, yeah it's frustrating. <laughs> like, and they've all got the same issues. Yeah, for sure, for she sure. So much insight, so much insight. And I mean, the likes of Sylvia Earle and Jane Goodall, who have actually either lived and lived with the chimpanzees or lived underwater in these like aquapods. I can't remember exactly what they call them. They had these chambers that started in, in the Caribbean or the Bahamas. Um, it started there and um, then they had these, yeah, she spent like days, several days living in this little like pod thing and you go out and you spend a couple hours observing the marine life and then you go in and you decompress. Or you de you're at the same depth, so you don't need to decompress, but you've got the same um, atmosphere of pressure inside your, your little pod unit <laughs> it's ab how cool and she's experienced this and and has this incredible story and insight and we we don't we don't give it the the credit or that we don't give the ocean the recognition that it deserves um i mean uh, it's a kind of it's a thread or a common thread within all of the planet's um ecos uh, ecosystems and gifts that it gives to us we, do, we don't until recently, I guess it's not really been the role of biodiversity has, has not been valued until now. You know, people are start. Hopefully, people are starting to wake up to the fact that the more biodiversity we lose, the more viruses we're going to have like this. Um, exactly. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we've always seen as the ocean is just like a boundless place that's never going to run out of a you know run out of anything. And I think that's exactly you know, how it's in, yeah. in those books in, from the nineties. Right. You know, that that's what everyone thought. They, they were dumping all, I mean, man, when they think about all the waste, the nuclear and nuclear yeah. waste mm. and dumps in the ocean. You don't want to go down that rabbit hole, eh? <laughs> that's not good. No. <laughs> no, you don't want to. <laughs> I'm not talking about that one. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a news story recently, and this was in between the, the uh, it was in the Irish Channel, so in between yeah England and Ireland, they, they stumbled across quite recently, like where during World War Two, after they'd had, just had loads of unexploded shells left over. Obviously, the war is finished, and they just went boop and just dropped like over a whole patch, just all these bombs in one area. It's yeah, it, there's lots of secrets and dirty secrets down in <laughs> under the waves, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, and um, I mean, Sylvia Earle is just amazing. She's just got the, the most soft voice. I listen to Sylvia yeah. Earle and I, I melt into my seat and I think, oh, and I was really gutted the other day because she actually had like an online... Um, I know, event. I missed it. Well, I the missed... office teacher, Craig, I know, yeah. I signed up and I couldn't make it. I, was, yeah. I didn't even know what I was doing. Yeah, I missed the time it zone was a little tricky. 
Yeah, she changed. Well, they changed the time zone. Um, I think it was a couple of hours before or something. So I was sat there like with my cup of tea, oh, just so excited to be having like the actual Sylvia Earle on my laptop. And then I clicked onto the link and it said like, this seminar is now over. I was like, no. Oh. Yeah, I, I completely missed it too, which was which was sad. But um, yeah, but it's amazing because obviously, you know, in the UK at least, and hopefully the world, you know, you've got David Attenborough as this beacon of, of hope and the, this voice for the planet. And then in my eyes, I see kind of Sylvia Earle as the female, like person that kind of sits alongside yeah. him. But when I speak to other people in England, for example, they have no idea who she is. Even yeah. a lot, sometimes a lot of people in the environmental sector don't know who she is either. Yeah. Which no, that's is, true. I, yeah, I mean, David Attenborough has has a uh, much more global impact, probably because yeah, because of the films, all of the films. There's so many films now um, that he's narrated. So yeah, I guess in comparison, um, what you've got, uh, Blue, what not Blue Planet? Now I'm thinking of Sylvia Earle's one. What's the name of her? Um, Mission Blue. Mission Blue. That's the documentary that she's done. Mission Blue. Yeah, you've got one versus like, oh my god, so many. A billion, so, yeah. yeah no I, I know i'm, re I'm really She's, worried uh, i'm really worried nice. about him because it feels like he's done a couple of um you know documentaries of late and it like in the documentaries you get this tone that these are his last documentaries and oh my god I'm i really, know I'm i've really had so much with the, with the our planet ones mm. i've had so much at the end of that because yeah i feel like he he's at his like the voice the tone everything that he uses he, he's at his last like he's grasping at straws for people to actually listen to him and heed the words mm. man i know <laughs> so this, this powerful people and i i actually thought about um trying to to keep using some of his uh, like filtering in people like important people's words <laughs> with my posts like uh, like on Wednesdays or something doing like a post with quote because they've they their influence just unfortunately it, it lasts for some people it's just uh, a momentary momentary response and then they forget about it and they move on yeah um and yeah how do we how do we help them keep their momentum because They've done so many incredible things and have so much wisdom. Um, yeah, it's almost like, you know, <laughs> they've got a huge platform. They've they've reached so many people. But how do we get those people to, to feel that impact last, make it last? Mm. Like, yeah, sustain the momentum. <laughs> yeah, it's, I guess it's actually like properly converting these people. I mean, if they've if they've watched a mm. documentary, if they've listened to his words, then they've got oh okay, they've got a bit of interest, and and then it's trying to convert that interest into a more long term connection, yeah, and, and then for them to be able to elicit change from that. There's so much cool stuff when I start reading into behavioral change and the science of behavioral change. I almost feel like that's going to have to be like another study for me when I'm all done with this. I don't think I'm doing another master's, but I'm going to do so. I'm going to learn I don't more think about you're, you're, you're never going to stop studying, Sarah. <laughs> I'm not, I, I honestly, <laughs> I, <laughs> I sound like an academic, but maybe I'm, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, it doesn't. It does feel sometimes like you're like, oh well, I'm I'm in academia for now, but I'm, I can't stay in academia. I'm not going to be I'm not going to be a lecturer. I'm not going to do my PhD kind of thing. But you, then you get out into the, the other, some other sectors, and you still feel like you don't belong. <laughs> but no, I I think I've got my niche when it comes to um, education. It just makes you feel like you've got you, the the kids, they, the youth, they give you hope, um, and and you actually feel like you can um, make some changes through through influencing them that's just like the most beautiful thing like thinking about the future of our planet is in their hands like really yeah um, yeah yeah no no that that's the thing isn't it i think the education well, at least for me definitely is, is the most important aspect i think mm -hmm. i think when i it was really um strange because as a school teacher if you want to be a school teacher you know you've got to be quite 
I guess, on the fence and sometimes quite neutral to allow children to really make up their own minds about these decisions and topics. But then from my perspective, I'm like, but that's that's like the tale of the, you know, the frog that sits in the boiling water then then doesn't jump out and keels over. I feel like if you know this planet um, is suffering, then <laughs> my my um, prerogative is to <laughs> is to turn everyone into David Atom, into mini Atom or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think I mean the children these days are a lot more savvier and they grow up a lot quicker than I think we at least I did when I was younger, just because they have access to so much information. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they they have like YouTube, for example, is the you know number one search channel, and they if they if they really want, like most children do these days, actually, they do spend a lot of time online and they're just flicking from thing to thing to thing to thing. So yeah. if we can, I don't know, if we can market things that can spike their interest in these new platforms yeah. where they're spending a lot of their time, then hopefully that'll, you know, generate this, this next generation yeah. of ocean stewards. Using media for good. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's quite, I mean, it's good like that because before with, journalism and media it's always top down it's controlled by the top and you're kind of force fed you know whatever they produce essentially whereas now we have the ability to make our own media I guess what we're doing now <laughs> in that sense. yeah yeah <laughs> so what are your okay so what are your recommendations then for the future of ocean protection or how can people get involved and plug um, your, I plug your blog <laughs> um yeah i think that uh, finding finding out more um so seeking out information to, to inform themselves um is probably yeah at the top of the list so that's one thing like i tell the kids um uh, one of the slideshows has you know what can you do to help protect the ocean kind of thing and the top one is educate yourselves and i'm like look you're doing it right now you guys are learning about it and um, if you're listening, you're you're learning about <laughs> some of the perils of the ocean and some of the most um, there's there's some really interesting stuff out there that I I haven't even had the time to just explore some of those really cool topics um, that you're just like I could listen to this 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 and learn more and it's just like a um, you can spiral um, basically just by learning. By learning more about the ocean um it can really just yeah open your eyes to what's in there so so educating yourselves um get it supporting ngos that are actually doing um the uh lobbying so um in new zealand there's there's several of them but i think it needs to we really need to collaborate more and i see that that's happening more um i definitely have felt from some organizations that merc works with um, feeling that everyone's kind of on the same page. I'm not going to try and compete with your resources. We're going to kind of share our resources, join forces, and together we can. So that's like, you know, the most power, one of the most powerful messages that you can try and ingrain into people is like, together we, we can actually do this. I think um, that's really important, actually, because I mean, I've already just worked for kind of volunteer projects and stuff like that. But, you know, I've been on a, an island collecting data for one turtle project and there's two or three other projects on the same island collecting the same data but not showing resources sharing information and applying for the same mm -hmm. funding grant and it seems to be a big thing in science where it's you know it, it's competition almost between different organizations yeah. and and it doesn't further I mean I, I feel like it hinders um like scientific yeah. exploration like I think you're completely Absolutely. right collaboration should be should be how we kind yeah. of dig ourselves out of these holes yeah so when you when you find the right people to work with or when you find the right people to follow like um <laughs> you're, you're someone who you trust that's giving you that that um that information i guess is like for us we kind of look up to sylvia earl and those other influencers in a sense that have a inspired us and b provided us with really um good information um so yeah, once once you find that, then you can um, search search into um, taking more action through through either through their avenues. Like right now, that's actually something that I'm I'm really working on, trying to 
have something on my I speak for the sea platform that people can be like ah, click here like do more right like I want to do more sign me up but at the moment um yeah we, we we need to get marine reserve proposals all ready to go before they actually get support so at the moment there's several there's a lot of people talking about projects in the Heriki Gulf um about creating protected areas and stuff like that but but right now it's almost like it's not at the stage yet where they need all the people behind them it's just getting getting going still um and that's why i guess it's it's like find find those those influencers and in, in that you uh, align with i guess for for the average person you know it, it, it could be the likes of david attenborough and they, they i think that these people are going to have more um more ability to point people in the right direction of what to do next but it's hard because you don't for for those big influencers and, and they might not be they might be avoiding being political or something and i i mean every every area will have their own specific actions that they need to do so i think for the hierarchy goals yeah support um following um the hierarchy goal forum and their journey to trying to achieve more protection, restoring mussel beds, um, and that kind of thing. Um, there's research currently being done on the urchin barrens um, that are developing in New Zealand. And, and there should be, I think it's opening real soon for submissions, um, a, a, a look at how we manage um, fisheries in New Zealand. They're going to open submissions for people to have their say. And it's just like, yeah, becoming becoming an advocate for what you care about is is like what every individual can do. And it, it might only take a couple, you could take just a couple minutes in your week and sign a couple petitions. It might take the, the effort to find those. I'm gonna try and put, um, I've been trying to feed through um, my group, We Speak for the Sea at the moment, which is, I'm trying to build that and, it, and, and put things that you can just take some, some quick action, you know, today, and then, you know, next week, there's some quick action that you can do. And it just means that you're showing your support for, for change. And that momentum should hopefully carry people into, into these bigger projects like marine reserves um, and getting behind marine reserve proposals. It's just unfortunate that there's not, you know, there's not a real good, clear answer when it's like, what can I do? You know, I wish there was a clearer answer. Be, you know, like, follow me <laughs> because... <laughs> I'm going to find the answer. <laughs> what we can you do? I'm going, to, I'm going to get back to you. Guide. <laughs> I'm going to get back to you. But yeah. 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 Well, I think, you know, that means that I guess the beauty of uh, living in these modern times is, you know, we have these and, you know, children from younger ages have access to, to you know, supercomputers in their hands where they're able to access information and they are able to get involved and take action. Uh, just by using something like this. Yeah, yeah, is, very true. Right. No, I think that's some. I think that's really, really, really good advice. And I think, um, oh, it, it's quite nice. I mean, just having this conversation makes me like feel inspired, and um, yeah, makes me me feel positive. It's just, it's so nice when there's there's other people out there in the world who really have a passion to kind of protect oceans, or oh, you know, just protect the planet in general, and actually want to do everything they can to help other people or allow other people um, to do that too so and actually yeah you're inspiring me with everything that you've been doing so it's really nice to actually see how our journeys have kind of in parallel across like you know cross oceans mm. um from working at the dive shop together to just you know doing very different projects but but keeping on you know but carrying on oh i forgot to ask you about your re reincarnation so is there a particular creature <laughs> that you would um, come back as? Um, a spinner dolphin. A spinner dolphin? Yeah. Okay, why is yeah, that? Specifically them. Oh man, like they get some height and they just spin <laughs> round and round and round. Um, so I guess just because dolphins look like they have so much fun and yeah. in my next life I need to have as much fun as I'm having now. So I think the dolphin would help that. Um, and I also... I uh, know it's it's definitely a myth. It is a myth. Dolphins are not the only creatures that have sex for fun. They are not. We don't know how to really define it, but 
they have a lot of fun and they um yeah so i think don't they have because i i'm pretty sure i saw this so that day in goat island the marine reserve where, where i was swimming around with the dolphins under the water while they were like playing about with me they were also i'm pretty sure at the same time like they were having sex at the same time while they were going past me yeah apparently it's not all the time that they're having sex to try and produce like reproduce um which is exciting yeah and and sometimes it has to do with social dominance or other kind of pod like social cues in the pod um but yeah no they definitely have more sex visually like you know they put on a show more often than most other sea creatures so they they definitely do um exhibition they also know how to surf like they legit surf you know you see them surfing inside the waves man that's so awesome i want to do that okay i think that's i think that's a good choice i think that's a brilliant choice you've got everything there fun surfing intelligence yeah spinner dolphins man yeah, <laughs> i i, I I've now picture you like uh you know if you were a kid or something like you know pretending to be a spinning dolphin by just like standing in your back garden and just going round and round and round and round like jumping up in the air and Actually, that's one of the things that's funny you say that when I was a kid, that's how I used to walk. And my mum got would try to get me to stop for years. But instead of just kind of walking, I would take two steps, spin around 360, take two steps, spin around 360. And that's literally how I used to walk. And then when it came to you know uh, skating, when I was in my teens, it was amazing because I could spin so fast and I could spin so much where I was <laughs> as a kid. Yeah, it's not something that I do so much currently, but I and I definitely didn't walk like you did. But um, <laughs> man, that's funny. I get dizzy <laughs> if I yeah. spin too much in life. <laughs> yeah, that's probably too much motion sickness for you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so if people want to read your blog and um, you know um yeah visit your site and kind of connect with you then how are people able to do this you can find me at www.icecrecy.com or um i'm on facebook and instagram and my handle is sarah speaks with C, and i don't have an h in my name <laughs> <laughs> oh <So>. yeah <laughs> i have to say I'm that about my gonna... name they're like with a y no it's an ie oh. E, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, does that make it harder for people? Don't you? I thought that most people would spell it without an H. Anyway, yeah, Sarah speaks to the <laughs>